Cristiano Ronaldo, yes! Yes! David Beckham has done it, big time! Hello and welcome to the Hedo and Seva Uncharted podcast. Seva, welcome. Cheers, Matty. Uh, we had a good uh, last couple of episodes with our two friends, Mark and Logan Guy. Yeah, it was, uh, it was awesome, eh? It was good having them boys come in. Plenty of laughs and uh, plenty of stories and we hope the viewers at home, we hope, we hope you got a, a few good stories out of them, a few good laughs. But today we have the voice of Australian football, Simon Hill. Welcome to the Head Owen Sever Uncharted podcast. Thanks for having me, boys. How are you? Yeah, very good, mate. Very good. Thanks for coming on, mate. It's uh, Pleasure. For me, it's a privilege to interview such a, uh, well, what I, what I said was the voice of Australian football. So, mate, I'm really looking forward to it. And I know Thanks. Sever is as well. Yeah, I am. Definitely. Um, you're the Martin Tyler of our game. <laughs> been a long time, Sever, since I call your name in the A-League. I know, it's been a while. We were actually having a conversation in the car on the way here. I think you wrote an article about uh, Sever in the... Uh, I can't was remember it? what it was about. I hope it was a nice one. No, it was a great one. It was awesome. It was, mate, I think he still got it above the bedhead, mate. I think it was one of the only nice articles he got written about him. <laughs> I think it was 442. I think it was 442. Yeah. Yeah. In a 442 yes, magazine. Was. Well, I stopped, I stopped writing for them in 2013, so that tells you how long ago it is. Yeah, yeah brilliant. Um, Simon, we've... Obviously, we um, w- once we inter- said you were coming on, we've had a lot of people say to us in the pub and, and just around that they um, they can't wait for this, right, to, to see who the real Simon Hill is behind the microphone. So, mate, can you give us a bit of background on, on where you were born and where the love of football started for you? Well, as you can tell by the jersey, which I wore especially for you, um, I was born in Manchester uh, in 1967, so that makes me an old fart. Um, And I grew up basically with a ball at my feet and the love of football in my heart because my dad uh, instilled it in me virtually. You know, the first memory I have is um, kicking a ball around in the back garden with him and uh, going to watch Man City uh, on a Saturday. He took me to my first game when I was... Not even six, I don't think. Um, and I've since learned it was against Ipswich Town. I don't remember too much about it, but uh, it was 1974, April of that year. Uh, City against Ipswich. We lost, apparently, 3-1, <laughs> which was a portent of things to come for many years. Yeah. Um, and that was it, basically. I, I was hooked, not just on the game, but, you know, my team. Um, and I think, you know, there were obviously there was that parental influence. My, my granddad was a City fan all his life. Uh, my great-granddad actually played played for Manchester City before they were even Manchester City in 1892 when they were known as Ardwick FC. So this is like a family heirloom that was, you know, handed down from generation to generation. Uh, and I didn't really have much choice in, uh, for 30 odd years. So I was, I was quite bitter about that, to be honest, but uh, um, obviously not, not more recently. But yeah, it, it came from there. Um, and as soon as I went to that first game, I saw the sky blue jerseys, which I fell in love with. You know, it's weird how as a kid, colour is very, very important. And I loved the sky blue um i loved colin bell he was my absolute hero um and all of the city players of that era asa hartford joe royal Mm. willie donachie dave watson dennis Stewart, peter barnes um brian kids you know i just that was my team It, it was my ritual it was my bond with my dad it was what we did every weekend uh and obviously you know when i wasn't watching city i I was playing for clubs and school and you know all that sort of stuff so it it's been in me ever since i can remember and it still burns as bright today thankfully yeah and and so where did where did you decide to become a commentator then so did it just come naturally to you or you hear like people like ray warren and that started young and they were they they were calling certain stuff was that you as a commentator or did it just come sort of fall into your lap or was it something you always wanted to do well not really to be honest I wanted to work in football and I'll I'll take you back to where this started. So when I was 12 and I was playing for my club side, which was called Utrington Rovers in the outskirts of Manchester and a Manchester City scout actually came to watch us. Uh, a guy called Eric Malander, who's very famous at spotting talent for City. And I knew he was coming. We all knew he was coming to watch us. And I, you know, I ran around like a blue ass fly for 90 minutes trying to impress this, this scout. <laughs> he never even looked at me. Uh, he actually signed our goalkeeper, a guy called Steve Crompton, who I'm still in touch with today. Steve uh, won the FA Youth Cup with City, never actually played for the first team. But I, I knew from that moment on, I wasn't good enough to be a footballer. Okay. I knew that in my heart. So the next best thing for me was 
was, okay, so how do I work in football? And to be honest, what I wanted to do, to do was write. I wanted to write for the newspapers. Um, so when I finished my degree um, in Portsmouth, which was on in an unrelated subject, because you couldn't do journalism as a degree in, in those days, I, I got on the postgrad um, journalism pre-entry course, a training course for journalists in Portsmouth and started uh, doing that. And my first job was actually uh, writing match reports for the Portsmouth youth team okay. uh, wow. in the Southeast Counties combination many, many years ago. So that, that was my dream. That was my ambition. But when I graduated in 1991, unfortunately, the UK was in the middle of a massive recession and there were no jobs in journalism. So almost out of desperation, I, I applied for a job with a local radio station in South Wales uh, because they'd, they'd advertise for a commercial copywriter, basically writing adverts. Yep, and I yep. thought, well, that's about as near as I'm going to get, you know, to this. And they wrote back to me and said, look, we don't think you're quite suitable for this job. However, there is a job here as a sports reporter. And we've noticed that you've, you know, you've done a bit of written journalism. Would you be interested? So my career sort of changed and I was only 23, 24 then. So my career sort of changed from being in, in written journalism almost overnight to being in broadcast journalism. Uh, I was in radio for many, many years. Um, of course, I'm now full circle back at SEA. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I was I was in radio for ten years. With, you know, first with Red Dragon, this this little radio station, and then with the BBC, and then up to national radio, uh, BBC Radio Five Live, BBC World Service. Um, and it wasn't until the late '90s, really, that I, I sort of crossed over into television, which a lot of radio people did after a few you know years behind the microphone on radio. So that's what I did. And the commentary started as early as 1993 okay. when I went to a station called BBC Radio Lancashire, which was based in Blackburn. And uh, my producer, a guy called Guy Havord, who I'm still in touch with today, still works for Sky Sports in the UK, um, said, uh, right, first weekend of the new season, which was August 93, you're going to go and do commentary at Chelsea against Blackburn Rovers at Stamford Bridge. And oh, I said, wow. I've never done commentary. <laughs> and he said, well, let's see if you can do it. So I went and I did it. That was my first ever. You know, some people wow. start at low, low, lower league level. Yeah. I started at Stamford Bridge. I was just about. I was just about to <laughs> ask that. Where was game. the? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Really. And I've been doing it ever Stanford since. Bridge. Yeah. And and you you obviously love commentating, right? Is that is that a, a love for you now? Like not now. You're obviously not commentating <laughs> well, as not much. Not doing it at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but do you enjoy yeah, that I side mean, of the football? Yeah, absolutely. It's the best job in the world. Yeah. Um, and I miss it, to be honest. I miss it terribly. Um, and I'm angry and uh, upset that I'm not doing it at the moment, but I'm hoping that's only giving me a short-term uh, issue. Um, but yeah, it, you know, you've got the best seat in the house. You're talking about football for 90 minutes. Name what me else? a better job yeah, in the world. Perfect day. playing it. Does it remind you of like being like an ex-player, like uh, like game day? Like you know, you, you get to the ground early, the crowd build oh, yeah. up, the smell of like you know hot food getting get oh, yeah. in the corner and that. I mean, the buzz. you know, when you, you think back to to some of the big games, I'm not just talking about here in Australia. You know, when I was in the UK, I, I covered a cup final at Wembley, Manchester United, wow. Liverpool. Yeah. Um, I did the same fixture at Old Trafford. Called my own team at Main Road. Um, you know, uh, northeast derbies between Newcastle and. Sunderland, Edinburgh derbies between Hearts and Hibs, um, wow. you know, Af African Cup of Nations finals I did, Asian Cup finals. You know, these are just brilliant experiences oh. and you get that buzz. Now, I've never been a professional player, but I can only imagine that it's, you know, even better than what I experienced as a yeah. commentator, um, waiting for the teams to come out and going, wow, you know, I'm going to I'm going to describe this game to potentially millions of people if it's big enough. It's I had no idea... That you did all that, eh? Uh, yeah. Zero idea. We were, um, I've, I've got a People question. People think I started in Australia. So. Yeah. And, yeah. well, I've got a question. <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to a few things, but I've got a question down here um, about what you think would be a few of the biggest games you've called. And um, you've just rattled off, obviously, a few there. But was there a game where you were really nervous beforehand, knowing the, knowing the, the win or lose, something was going to happen? Was, was there any nerves? Oh, yeah. Tell us about one of them. I mean, plenty. You know, down the years, um, obviously the the World Cup qualifier against Uruguay yeah. in 2005. You know, I was very. I'd only been in Australia for 18 months, then, but I was well aware of the magnitude of the occasion. Uh, similarly, the opening World Cup game against Japan in Germany 2006. Massive. Um, I Massive. knew that there were millions of people, you know, listening uh, back in Australia. So I was very, very much aware of that. But equally, you know, there are other games that won't be as uh, familiar to people here, such as that African Cup of Nations final yep. between. 
between uh, South Africa and uh, Egypt back in 1998 in Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso, which was listened to by millions wow. around the world on radio. The FA Cup final that I did for the World Service, Man United Liverpool, where uh, Eric Cantona scored oh, the winner. Oh, yeah. um, you know, there, there, are, there are games like that. I did a European Championship final the same year, Germany against Czech Republic, when uh, Oliver Bierhoff oh, yeah. scored the golden goal winner. Uh, and I was hyping the gods at Wembley. You know, there, there are many, many uh, big occasions that I've had the privilege of being able to call. Um, and again, it's only afterwards that, you know, you go home and you go, wow, yeah. I, I just called the European Championship final. Wow. And I, I'll, gi- I'll give you one more. In fact, I'll give you two more. Sorry, I won't ramble on too long. No, don't stress. The, the, the first time I did it, my own team, which was at Main Road, uh, Manchester City against Leeds, I think it was, in the FA Cup. Uh, and City weren't nearly as good as they are now, and they lost 5-2. But I remember being very nervous, feeling very strange before that game because my place at Main Road was not in the press box. My place was in the stands with my dad cheering oh, on the team. Yeah, and now, I yeah. felt very nervous and, and odd almost like I was out of my comfort zone. It was a very, very uh, strange, strange feeling, that one. And, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not particularly sure that, uh, that I enjoyed that one. I'm trying to think <laughs> of the other one I was going to say now, and I've forgotten it. Anyway, it'll come back. Um, so so when, what made you move to Australia then, obviously 18 months before that, the Uruguay game, is that right? Yeah. And, and, and what was the yeah. reasons for coming down under? Um, it's a good question. It's a bit of a convoluted answer again, I'm afraid. Um, so after leaving the BBC in 2001, I went to a new channel in, in the UK called the ITV Sport Channel. And they were sort of the forerunner of today's BT Sports. They were set up to challenge Sky Sports, basically, in the right. UK. Um, and I went there because I was headhunted from the BBC. And uh, after 12 months, they had a crap business plan and the channel folded, basically. So <laughs> okay. we were all made redundant. Um, and I said... I, I, so I freelanced for about six months and actually got offered a contract by Sky Sports in 2002. Um, but I, I was just at a point where I was a, a little bit disillusioned with the TV industry in the UK because of what had happened at ITV. And I knew that I'd be sort of starting again a little bit from, not not totally from scratch, but a little bit from scratch at Sky, uh, which, which was a network at the time that it I'd done some freelance shifts then, and I didn't particularly enjoy it, to be honest. So a, a mate of mine that I'd been out to visit, <clears throat> excuse me, in Australia, he, I used to work with him at the BBC, lad from Manchester, City fan. We used to go and watch games uh, back in England. He'd emigrated out to Australia many years beforehand, and I'd stayed in touch with him. Um, he lived in Sydney, he worked for SBS Radio, and I came out to see him on holiday during this sort of interim period in 2002, and uh, he said, oh, there's a job going here, son, as a, as a commentator you'd be brilliant for it in his man accent, which he's still got <laughs> and I haven't um, and he and I said well they ain't gonna want me mate they don't know who I am I live over the other side of the earth no no you'd be brilliant for it and he went on about it for so long that eventually I said look when I get back to the UK I'll send in a CV and a show reel basically ch- to shut him up I thought that would you know keep him quiet and to my astonishment three or four weeks later I got a an email from Ken Ship, who is the deputy head of sports at SBS saying that we're very interested um you know, we'd like to get you over here. So I was, okay. wow. <laughs> I wasn't married. Um, I, I didn't have any kids, still don't have any kids. So I thought, well, this is a chance to go and do something different. Uh, I'd always wanted to live in a different country, experience, you know, different culture, different way of life. So I thought I'd come over here for a couple of years and, uh, and you you're know, still here. like every other British backpack and go <laughs> home after that, but I'm still here. <laughs> um, so <laughs> all right. You, you, you did touch on it then, that uh, Australia-Uruguay game. So was that, yeah. that, that was obviously only after 18 months, uh, as you said, yeah. moving to Australia and, and, like it was obviously a big game to call for you, mm. yeah, and the magnitude of it for, I guess, us Aussies. Yeah, were uh, you aware of it? Like how big? Oh yeah, because the game needed yeah. a shot in the arm, a massive one, and I think we got it that night. Yeah, I mean, I, I was very aware of it because by then, of course, I've been sort of, uh, you know, had the, the SBS love of football imbibed into yeah. me, which was I had already from the UK anyway. I didn't need telling how important football football was, um, but I, you know, I very quickly realised that the game here. Yeah. 
desperately needed them to qualify. Yeah. And of course, it was right at the outset of the A League starting as well. Yep. So, you know, we, we we had that excitement of the A League. I wasn't involved in that first season because I was still at SBS, um, but I, I could see how new and exciting the A League was. And I thought, blimey, if we qualify here for the World Cup, see, it was already we. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, th then this is going to be brilliant for the game here. So, and I'd been in Uruguay four days prior for the first leg as well. I'd call that one over in Montevideo, which was another incredible experience, by the way. Yeah, I bet it was. Um, and so, you know, by the time I got back here, everything had built up to this crescendo and it was just brilliant. And I remember the, the moment I thought Australia, because it was very much in the balance, you know, they were a good side, Uruguay. Yeah, they were. Great Rico players. Like Rico, Rico, the, Cobra, yeah. Ricardo Morales. Uh, I'm not sure Forlan played in that series, but Lugano, you know, they were a terrific team. Yeah. But I remember that when they walked out and the Uruguayan anthem played, and they'd done the same to us in Montevideo, and the Aussie crowd gave it to them. Yeah. I thought, yes. Yeah. Yes. Do, do you we think that? Do you because think you that, could see the coach, his eye, he had these big bulging yeah. eyes. Do you remember Jorge Fosati? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And he looked around as if to say, my God, I wasn't expecting this. And I thought, yeah, this is going to be great. And it and was. Like I got it from home that that crowd got football for the first time, yeah. understood yeah. what football was about. Like the the build up from Montevideo back over just caught the everyone's eye, and they were all football fans at that time. Yeah, I, I think the last crowd I remember was the '93 against Argentina when Maradona was here. Yeah, I, that was the first taste. I thought, oh, you know what? Like football, football is big here, but 2005, massive. Yeah. yeah. And, and so how did you feel then, obviously, sitting in the box, hearing all that, knowing that, yeah, we're on here? Was that what you felt? Yeah. I mean, it, you know, there, there were a few factors that sort of conspired against us as a commentary team that night. Um, first of all, I was very jet-lagged and so very tired. Um, oh, you would secondly, have been. of course, there was all the, the pandemonium of extra time and penalties. Yeah. And in the midst of all that was Craig Foster, who had completely lost the plot. Uh, <laughs> it was made. It was a fantastic didn't call. didn't at all. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I've explained this story quite a few times, but in the aftermath of that, everybody goes, oh, you know, what a night that was where did you go afterwards where did you go and celebrate you must have had a massive night that i went home straight to sleep i was i was gutted i was tired but i was also gutted because i didn't think our call was good wow um, it was too emotional now i know you see everybody goes huh yeah it was brilliant but at the time I think, and this was a lesson for, for me as a broadcaster, you know, probably all broadcasters, that it's not about you. It's about yeah. what happens on the pitch. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, we, our call has been remembered in the right way, which I'm very grateful for and pleased about because Australia won. Yeah, um, okay. And that was the important thing, you know. So um, technically it was an awful call, <laughs> but really it doesn't so? matter. Yeah. Well, we asked we asked Michael Thwait when he was on uh, earlier about the uh, the goose hitting influence, and and he just he, he raved about him, right? So mm. um, we he, he and I think he helped us, right? Obviously, he helped okay. us qualify, and he and he got that team up for what they needed to do. So he did. And I, you know, I, I witnessed him at close quarters in the build up, uh, both to the Uruguay game and to the World Cup in, in Germany. Um, in the build up to Uruguay, I don't know if you remember this, but they actually took them to Argentina, A, to keep them away from yes, the Uruguayan we, yeah, fans, yeah. but they also based them at probably the dingiest, most dangerous place in Buenos Aires, which was the home of San Lorenzo in wow. a place called Bio Flores. And let me tell you, I wouldn't let my dog walk the streets. Wow. Uh, at really? that place. And I think they did that purposely to sort of just, you know, introduce them to the idea that it was going to be pretty hostile and you're in yep. an unfamiliar uh, part of the world and you're going to have to deal with this. I mean, these guys knew it. They were experienced players anyway. And a lot of them have been there in 2001. Yep. Um, but in, also in the build-up to Germany 2006, um, he took them to a, a training camp in Mirlo in the southern part of the Netherlands. And I was there watching them every day and he flogged them. Yeah. I've never yeah. seen a coach work a squad so hard really and it was to get them physically fit because he knew that technically they probably couldn't match it with the very top teams in the world so if they weren't going to be the the, the best technically they were going to be the fittest they were going to be the best organized they were going to have plan a b c d and e yeah. and they did yeah and i remember the game against <clears throat> brazil which everybody forgets because yeah. we lost that one that was actually australia's best performance and in the build-up to that was, yeah. they played training sessions on a pitch that was only 30 meters with full goals 11 against 11 
So there was no space whatsoever. Pretty much shoot on sight. And hit, yeah, and hitting Hiddick's mantra was you've got to keep the ball for ten seconds. Got to keep right. hold, you've got to keep possession because yeah. he knew that the moment you turn the ball over to Brazil, so it's over. You <laughs> so they they played keep ball the whole week on a very you know limited playing set. It was brilliant to watch. He yeah. was mesmerising and it had the the media on a string. Absolutely yeah. fabulous coach and so smart mentally. So smart. Is he one of the best ones? Obviously, you think that we've had the most influential. Yes. Yes. Um, I wouldn't say he was necessarily the one I, I had a good relationship with Hus. Yep. Um, the one I had the best relationship with was Pim Verbeek. But in terms of his tactics, in terms of the way he dealt with the media, the way he dealt with his players, the way he prepared for games, uh, just his all round savviness and every facet of the job was just bewitching. He, he was, and he was aware of every single person in the room. He knew exactly who everybody was, what they were there for, what their background was. One, one more funny story for you. <clears throat> this is brilliant. <laughs> After the Brazil game, I don't know if you remember, the full-time whistle, Harry Kuehl went over and had a, a slangy match with the referee, Marcus Merck, because he thought that he hadn't given Australia you know, a lot a of... A fair go. Uh, a fair go. So Merck had apparently... Uh, berated Kuehl on the we, we all saw this. He berated him on the field. And what had transpired afterwards, and all the journos knew this, that Marcus Merck had said, you won't play against Croatia. I'm no. going to make sure that you're banned really? because of his being mouthy. So we were all primed to ask this question of Hiddink at the press conference. And Hiddink walked into a very tense press room and he sat down and he nodded and said, gentlemen, and at that precise moment as the first guy put his hand up to ask a question Hiddink's mobile phone rang and he said excuse me a moment <laughs> hello oh hi mom I'm a bit busy at the moment can you call me back <laughs> absolutely broke the tension 100% now I don't think it was his mom yeah. I think it was his Set press up. guy that he said yeah, wait till yeah, I sit yeah. down and, and ring my mobile phone that's the genius of Chus Hiddink and the rest of the press conference was a breeze because everybody was smiling and laughing how good! Absolute what genius. Yeah, yeah. And, and and Thwaite did say he was he was good for that, right? Oh, he said he thought outside the box Talks straight away. Um, then can you take us back to Foxtel? And were you involved in the second year of the A League? Is that when you went to Foxtel? Was, yeah, two thousand six oh yeah. seven. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, that was obviously on the back of us qualifying and all that. So was that really big back then for you, commentating? I guess uh, a big league here in in Australia. Yeah, I mean, obviously, a core Premier League in in the UK, but yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I wanted to go because, you know, when I came over here, SBS had much of the football. Not that there was an awful lot of football being shown on television mm. back then, because I arrived in the latter days of the NSL, and Channel Seven still had the domestic deal, which they bizarrely didn't show. Um, <laughs> but anyway, that had been sort of ripped up, and of course, the, the advent of the A League um, saw Fox come into play, and they took the rights. And I remember watching that first season, thinking, "This looks great. I'd love to be involved in this." Um, and of course, SBS then. Uh, lost the rights to the Socceroos as well, which Fox mm. took over. So for me, it was a no-brainer. Um, SBS didn't particularly want to let me go. That was a bit difficult. Okay. Um, and I felt guilty because they'd given me, you know, my chance in Australia and, and given me a home and a place to, to grow as a broadcaster. I'd also, you know, not just the Uruguay game, but I'd hosted the Ashes, you might remember, in yeah. 2005. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, they'd given me a lot of very good opportunities and I'm still very grateful to SBS. Um, but... I wanted to be where the football was, and that was Fox. Yeah. And fortunately enough for me, Fox were interested, so that's where I went. Yeah, how good. For 14 years. Yeah. Was. 14 years. For 14 Fox. years, yeah, till last year. Um, yeah, so we, so we might touch on that. So 14 years of, of giving up your weekends, commentating A-League, internationals, etc. on then. And, and from what we've seen in media and all that, the, it all of a sudden just ended for Simon Hill and the voice of Australian football was no longer on our, on our screens. Was, can you give us a little bit of insight into how, how it went down? 
Um, well, it was both a shock and not much of a surprise, to be honest, um, because, you know, Fox over the last two or three years, and I don't think this is any great surprise to people, you know, their commitment to the game, in my opinion, and a lot of other people's opinion has waned, um, you know, underlined by the fact that they've reduced the deal in mm. terms of its financial commitments. Now, you know, their argument will be as a business, well, it's not providing us with ratings or advertising. I, I sort of get that. Um, my issue really over the last two or three years was is that we weren't allowed to hold the people in power to account. Okay. Um, either the FFA or the clubs who've, you know, let this league and this game slide over the last three or four years. That's a journalist job. Um, I'm not just a commentator, and that's what they wanted to me, me to be. Okay. They wanted me to be a commodity. The, the voice of football line is something that they developed. I didn't ask for it. Yeah. Uh, they gave it to me. Um, and they like to use that. And of course, you know, for a long time, that was very nice for me. But what they really meant by that was you're the soundtrack to the games. Game, yeah. Um, well, that was never me. If you know me, you'll know that I was of an opinion and you don't have to agree with it. Um, but I'm passionate about football. I've been involved in it all my life. And when I get people telling me that I can't have opinions on a game that I've covered by people, incidentally, who wouldn't know yeah. that was Maradona uh, yeah, if they were in the same room. I was just about to say that. It's been, yeah. It was obviously not run by football people at times no. too, yeah? No. So, and it's still not. So, you know, look, you know, that was their prerogative. <clears throat> there were probably some, you know, financial issues around it, but they didn't give me a chance to renegotiate. I wasn't offered a chance to, you know, any sort of freelance work or anything. They wanted me out. Yeah. Um, they wanted me removed. Um, so, you know, they got their wish. Um, yeah, it was a shock. And obviously it's, um, it's very difficult. It remains so financially. I'm without a full-time income. Um, but the, the flip side of it, which has, has been good, is that I've got my voice back okay. and I'm going to bloody well use it. Yeah, and that, so, that's what we want to hear yeah. too, mate. It, well, football needs opinions. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sick and tired of the game being boxed into a corner and told to stay in its lane. And that's what I had to do for the last two or three years. Um, so, you know, we're now at a point in time where the landscape is changing. The digital space is opening up. Uh, you've got your podcast. Lots of other people have got podcasts. I've got a podcast. You know, we're, we're now starting to see more of a proliferation of opinions. Still not in the mainstream, Um which is very unfortunate. And that's, you know, personally why I think the game needs to go into a different direction because and if we stay where we are, then we're just signing up for more of the same. And I don't think that's healthy. Yeah. And, and that's what I was, I was going to take it to next. Um, do, you, do you think the A-League and the FFA itself should go in a different direction for the next broadcast rights? Or is, is Foxtel going to come back to the party at any point, do you think? Oh, probably. Um, look, it's not the FFA's decision to, or, or the FA, whatever they yeah, call it. Yeah, yeah. Um, to, it is the A League now. Where the A League and W League rights go, that's now with the clubs, clubs since yep. independence. Um, so they will make, you know, that decision. Um, look, it's possible that Fox, you know, particularly KO, will will bid for it, and you know, it's possible they could get some of it. Um, I hope they're not going to sign over lock, stock and barrel again. Yeah, every single because game. Because that's, that's really damaged the game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when, when you hand over, and I understand that cash is important, money is very vital to you know for the game to survive and thrive, but it can't be the only thing. That, that drives the next TV deal. We've we've had three years of essentially non-coverage mm. and it's killed the game. Yeah. Um, so that has to be corrected. And I think there are now opportunities opening up. You know, I don't know if, if Stan are going to bid or DAZN or Sports Flick or, you know, whoever yeah. it is. But I would hope that there's a little bit of competition in the market and that perhaps we can proliferate over, you know, two or even three of them um, to get a breadth, better breadth of coverage. Because at the moment in the mainstream, we have one view and that's the Fox Sports, Sports view. view. Yeah. And that's very much controlled yeah. by the management at Fox Sports. And they're not football people. No. So we have to change that if we've got any sort of ambition for our game, at least at professional level. And I hope that's going to happen. And and you look at Fox now, right? They've got their own rugby league channel, their own cricket channel, and their own AFL channel that they've got the rights to. But you, you, you don't see any football shows anymore. You don't see – all you literally see is a game and then see you later. You don't get, like, anything exactly. during the week. 
Look, you know, nobody, nobody's saying that football should necessarily have its own channel. No. Fox. It probably doesn't justify that at the moment in terms of its return. But there has to be a better commitment uh, to, to the, the coverage of the sport. I'm not just talking about the cameras at the game. Yeah. I'm talking about the discussion around it, you know, podcasts, written articles, everything else. It's got to be covered properly. Now, to be fair to Fox, for a long time it was. Yep. Yeah, yeah, there was. an awful lot in football for which we should be grateful but their focus has shifted and that's fair enough they're a business not a charity they're they're not you know forced to give us money they're not forced to give us coverage but equally we can't be beholden to somebody Mm. who doesn't love us because the game needs TLC at the moment it needs to rebuild and to do that needs to be in partnership with a broadcaster that wants it values it and is going to invest in it over the next few years well, personally like that, I don't think that's Fox but I don't know it seemed like that right at the right at the start uh, Simon I remember when uh, Chad Gibson done that first commercial with Hyundai and it was like all right we've got a broadcaster that's behind the sport it was what what happened what changed there was a change of regime so but that's not a change, the game. Look, a change of management regime, but also I think a change of editorial focus, in part driven by economics, to be yeah. fair. Yeah. Um, you know, the landscape was changing and they weren't getting the returns, not just on football, but on all of the sports. Um, I think they overspent on, on other sports. Mm. Um, and as a result, sports like ours and rugby union, yeah, yeah. incidentally. We suffered. Um, we, we, we suffered because of that, uh, which was probably unfair. But as I say, you know, the, the, the sport doesn't have a divine right uh, to be funded you know ad infinitum by a broadcast they're more than entitled to walk away from it but I think at the moment what's going on is a little bit of a game of cat and mouse because you know KO still needs to be populated by content so yeah. football gives them that so they're trying to sort of keep hold of it piecemeal b- but without a real commitment to that, that's not good enough for Cause, our game because they've got to sell because so. they've got to sell subscriptions right and they of can't course. sell subscriptions without content you know and of course. They're, 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 they're giving out a little bit of football content right like <laughs> It seems the last two or three years, the, the game of football is bigger than anyone or, or any organisation. It seems to be that it's, uh, it's been held at ransom. It, it is a little bit. And, but, you know, having said that, and again, this is where it gets tricky, you know, you've got to have competition in the marketplace mm, of to go somewhere else. Yeah. Now, is there another investor? Is Stan, is DAZN, is Sports Flick, is somebody else, you know, willing to step into that breach? Because it, it's a big financial hole oh, that, yeah. that they're going to leave if, if they're not there. So you've got to have a plan B. Um, and that's what, you know, concerns me at a little bit at the moment. Yeah. Uh, do we have that plan B? I don't know. So, um, I, I hope so because we're running short of time. You know, yeah. it's yeah. <laughs> three or four months and, and this deal is over. So they, they've got to get a move on. Um, but do, you, do you think that promotion and relegation will help obviously more content? Do you think that if the second division got up and there was promotion and relegation and then that end of season there was always something to play for, so the, a relegation battle, do you think that gives a broadcaster more initiative. Uh, yeah, initiative to get on board? Well, it does if you understand it. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think there's... I can't see that Fox would be interested in it, to okay. be honest. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's, you know, part of their top-tier sport. I mean, football isn't as a game yeah, at the yeah, moment yeah. in, in you're, their you're eyes. Right. So a second division, uh, you know, I, I doubt they would be interested in that. Okay. Um, but I think as a game, we have to have it. Um because that's part of our culture. And this goes back to the fundamentals of, you know, who we're providing our professional sport for. Are we trying to appease a mainstream that's pretty lukewarm about our game? Or are we actually trying to attract some of the football fans that we've lost by appeasing that mainstream? Now, for me, it's the latter. Mm. You know, four or five years ago, our game was going great. (laughs) Now, I I used to go to the Wanderers. Uh, The place was packed out. Uh, You could feel the atmosphere. Same at Sydney, same at Victory, uh, same at one or two other places on on certain days. We were really building that tribalism, that that culture of football. And we killed it stone dead because of a few idiots and an article in the Daily Telegraph, Mm. which we desperately tried to appease by saying, oh, no, 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 we're not like that. We're just like you we're just like rugby league we're just like afl we're just like cricket but we're not mate. i don't care we're, we're not we should you know we, the catch cry was we are football well let's start behaving like it mm. because that is our culture of tribalism 
and of second divisions and of promotion and relegation. Yeah, of course, it's difficult. We know Australia's a big country and there are financial yeah. uh, logistical issues to deal with. But at some point, we've got to stop kicking the can down the road and saying, we'll have another con- consultancy about that. Um, yeah. <laughs> Send we'll someone else chat in. chat about that some more and see if we can find a model. Either you do it or you don't. Get on with it one way or the other. And then we all know where we stand. Football's got to start being bold mm. and believing in its own future. And, I, I you know, sometimes I, I worry that the, the, the game is too risk averse because we, we, we see this big bully on our shoulder, the mainstream, going... You're crap, and yeah. you're always your going thir- to be your, your third or fourth tier. Well, stuff them. Yeah, you know, do do what's good for our game. So, do you think that the the split of the A League clubs is going to help us then moving forward? If they're forming, if they're making decisions on their own for their clubs, do you think that's a a, a tick in and a, and a good move well, in the right direction? Maybe not for a second division because <laughs> yeah. I don't think they particularly want it at the moment. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, look, I think in the you know in the short to medium term, it, I, I was in support of the clubs having a say. I wasn't in support of the revolution that happened, but I was in support of the evolution that should have. Okay. Um, unfortunately, again, we ran into this age-old problem that we have in football in Australia of <laughs> politics, of power and control. And Frank Lowy did a fantastic job for ten years absolutely incredible took us to you know unseen heights before and then in 2015 when it came his turn to stand down and power should have been devolved slowly back down through the game you know bit by bit piecemeal step by step instead no you've got to stay within you know the, the the realms of what he'd put in place and the clubs weren't going to wear that and I supported them in that because mm. they'd, they'd gone on long enough bleeding cash mm. so if you what's the old saying if you fail uh, if you fail to evolve you set and train the conditions for revolution mm. and that's what happened that's and what we happened. didn't need it we didn't need a three year governance war no. but that's what we got that's what and we it's got. killed us again we just spoke about that on the way in, yeah, literally. Yeah, actually, you know, I um, I, I'm a massive admirer of uh, Peter Valandis. What he done with Racing Australia, the NRL, and uh, do you think someone mm. needs to just take the bull by the horns? Is there someone out well, there? Uh, look, I, I don't think necessarily. We we have a bit of a messiah complex in football. I, I don't necessarily think it's one person. I think it's a collective effort. And yes, Peter Valandis is you know he's very aggressive and he's very bullish and he gets things done. Brilliant to. Uh, tip my hat to him he's also dealing with a much more compliant market with his sports mm. than we have massive scale you know in sydney and brisbane and the eastern seaboard in general you know if you say rugby league says jump the rest of the population will you know cry in unison yes how high um in football they tell us where to go so it's not quite as easy as that but i think you know our collective strength has always been the fact that we have this massive base but it's completely disconnected from the top tier and that's our game operates in silos you know we all we all look like this the clubs look like this the MPL clubs look like this the member fed clubs look like this the players look after their own the coaches the FFA everybody nobody sees the bigger picture Rob Rob Sherman said this when he quit as technical director after I think it was a year he couldn't get anything in place because they all just did their own thing yeah (laughs) He takes any notice of each other. Um, So, you know, if we can get to the point where we can actually work together instead of fighting against each other, Mm. then we might have half a chance. See, that's like a lot of the viewers want to know that. Like, they just see something falling apart. They have no idea why it fell apart. Like, listening to someone like yourself who, you know, always got the ear to the ground. People want to hear this. That's right. written in the papers because to a certain point they do control the media as well. So, well, I th- to be honest, I don't think football has any control over the media at no, the moment. It just gets um, written, whatever. <clears throat> it's, you know, if, if you're going to get one of the things that you used to say to me to, uh, at Fox is, oh, it's always, you know, with football, it's all soccer. It was always soccer. soccer yeah. um, it, it's always politics. You know, the, the only stories we ever read is politics. Why don't you talk about the game? And I was like, well, if you, if you look at the five back pages of the Daily Telegraph, there'll be a hundred rugby league stories and maybe one of them yeah. will be about politics. politics. The problem yeah. is we only get one piece in the paper. <laughs> yeah. So if the politics is the biggest story, that's the way it's going to be. It's and until sorry. you get the politics in our game resolved, the game's never going to move forward on the pitch anyway. 
Yeah. So you have to talk about That's it. I, I'm bored of it too, but we have to. Shim, do you remember watching the Tim Cahill DVD? I remember he, was, he must have flown in from the country, got himself in a car, and he's there. He's opened the paper. He goes, we're on the eve of qualifying for a World Cup. And he goes, page four, page four. There was still nothing. Nothing yeah. in the paper. Yeah. Come on. Like, Well... I mean, a lot of people say now that, you know, papers are sort of obsolete because the younger generation are not reading them. And I, I accept that. But what they do, particularly the, you know, the mainstream, and I'm talking about News Corp because they own, as we know, 70% yes, yeah. of the Australian media, oh. is that they drive the online conversation. You might not buy a paper and read, you know, in the old-fashioned way, but you're still reading those articles online. You're reading the opinion pieces, the commentary pieces. All of that stuff gets filtered online. So people are still consuming it, even if it's in a different way and that's why it's problematic for our game because we are not of that culture Correct. and we are not uh, almost welcome in it so we, we've got to find a new way using this new digital space mm. that we can carve out you know our own niche and and the people are there it's been proven in the past they want our game to succeed they love football but at the moment they're very disconnected from it yeah, and we can we can see like that too. Obviously, with Melbourne Victory in the way they are at the moment, and their fans, you know, protesting down in in Melbourne, like they were essentially the biggest club in Australia at one point, and now they're at rock bottom. Um, and then we see Central Coast, who were obviously rock bottom for the last few years, and now top of the table. You know, so football can football can go places in this country, right? It's um, it's just well, the, you know the great thing about Victory is even though they're bottom of the table and they're, they're pretty ordinary at the moment, there's a lot of noise around them because they're a big club. Mm. That shows that people care. That's great. Yeah. Uh, the fact that they're, you know, utterly pissed off that they're bottom of the table is fantastic. It's a great job. Yeah. It and it gives us, um, it sh shows us in a good light, I guess, that people do care about our game. Absolutely. And, you know, victory will be back, but, you know, they've got some issues on and off the pitch at the moment. And one of them is, you know, the continual uh, insistence at playing at Marvel Stadium. Marvel, yeah. Fans don't want it. Mm. They don't want to play at big mm. oval stadiums. They don't enjoy the, the experience. So we, we had that conversation. Why don't we listen to the fans? Yeah. I, I remember playing there yeah. and, um, it was when Harry Kewell was playing. I remember, yeah. Oh, mate, warming up, it was like there were 10, 12,000 people there. Like, it, unbelievable atmosphere. You, you, you literally shit yourself if you weren't ready for it, eh? Yeah. I think we got done about 3-1, but it should have been about 6. Like, the ref was on our side. <laughs> it was just crazy. Like, yeah, so Amy Park is... I think it's like like Simon Hill's voice, but the home of football, to be honest. Yeah, and we've... Severa and I have had this conversation with ourselves. Like... You go over to England, right, and they don't – they're, they're purpose-built football stadiums, right? Even in the FA Cup, they don't move it to Wembley just for the sake of moving it to Wembley, right? You go there, however many tickets are available are available, right? Do, do we – do in your opinion, if we build the 15, 20,000-seat stadiums, rectangular stadiums for football, in your opinion, is that good? Because I, I, I think that's a perfect amphitheatre for, like, for a football match. Of course it is. And, and you know, that's why – I know people are very sceptical about Western United. Oh, they're never going to build this stadium. It's never going to get done. And they're sort of nomads at the moment. But one of the reasons they, they did come into the A-League was on the – you know, assumption that they were going to build this build stadium. Right, yeah. And that's what football needs. Mm, yeah. You know, the, the best stadium in the country is Cooper's, Adelaide United, uh, yeah. because oh, it's like theirs. Yeah, yeah. It looks like theirs. It feels like theirs. It smells like theirs. It's got red seats that spell AUFC, yeah. Yeah. and it's a proper football ground, yeah. and it's tied to the pitch. That's why football fans love it. Mm. Um, now, we don't have a lot of those, unfortunately. Bank West in, you know, Western Sydney is a great stadium. It's not exclusively the Wanderers, but it's, you know, it's a beautiful stadium. Yeah, it is. Uh, for the life of me, I still can't understand why Sydney FC are going back to the Sydney Football <laughs> Stadium because it's going to be 50,000. Why? It's going to be half empty every week. <laughs> to me, that, that's, a, that's a no-brainer to go somewhere else. It doesn't ha always have to be a new build. There are lots of you know facilities around the country that could be renovated and made into purpose-built football stadiums that are the correct size for our sport that brings in the sort of atmosphere that our game um, can create and at the moment we just seem hell bent on going to the biggest the stadiums stadium. possible for some <laughs> bizarre reason I've got no idea but probably corporate money I don't know Maybe we we certainly agree on that now Simon you, you you're back on radio with SEN Yes, uh, I am. And and Tuesday how you, nights. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, congrats on that. You Thank and you. you and Alex Bross on a Tuesday night? 
Me and Alex Brosk, um, a program, <coughs> excuse me, called The Global Game. Uh, so it's two and a half hours of football chats and guests, etc., cetera, from uh, 9.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern through to midnight. So we've, we only started last week. So it's uh, it's episode two tomorrow, which is Tuesday. So I'm looking forward to it. It should be great. Is the film live, Simon? It's not filmed. It's radio. Yeah, we go live. Yeah, we go live. Yeah, we go live. We go live in Sydney and the Gold Coast and South Australia, and I think the rest of the country we're on the SEN app that you can uh, download from the App Store. So we we are literally live all right, all over the country. How yeah. good! We'll ha- we'll have to tune into that. And on uh, and you and you've got your own podcast uh, which we can see in the background there. Shim Spider there and more. Shim Spider, so much more. Yeah, with Zelko Kalitz and uh, Craig Moore. So um, we get them on every week and uh, they're, they're pretty <laughs> forthright with their opinions as well we have I love it to be honest yeah. it's a top podcast on it's a top podcast yeah. are you enjoying stuff like podcasting and I know look <coughs> we're just we're, we've just started up and we're having a go but we actually we're quite enjoying getting the opinions of um, of people that are coming on and, and not being able to be held back I guess that's what's sort of keeping us excited yeah look it's it's fun it's something different and again you, you know you've got that unrestricted license to to say what you think which which I really enjoy um, and I'm enjoying doing a variety of things at the moment you know the the, the podcast the radio uh, I've done a few commentaries for uh, MPL, for Sports Flick. Um, you know, obviously I hope to do more next season. Yep. Uh, I'm writing a few articles for various websites. So, yeah, there's a, there's a nice bit of variety there at the moment. But uh, obviously the core part of my job at the moment is missing, which is uh, commentary. So I'm hoping yeah, to get that back. Yeah, and we hope, we hope to have you back on our screens. Thank you. Well, Simon, look, we can't thank you enough for coming on. It's been a uh, huge privilege for me to, to, in, to interview you and you'd be so open. And, and, and honest on, on our show, Seva. So, oh, of course. Like, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you, Simon. Um, Andy yeah. Burnell has got a book coming out, Riding Shotgun. He does. Yeah. Are you going to be at the launch? Uh, I'm going to try to be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's on. It's in April, isn't it? Yeah. Can April. Me the uh, date. April 27th. 27th of April. 20, 27th yeah. of April. Uh, yeah, I'm going to. I'm going to try and get that. I did ask for an invite, so uh, I'd love to go and see uh, Birch. He's, he's a good fella, and um, for, we had him on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, and it, uh, yeah. by the sounds of it, it's going to be a very interesting book. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Well, we're, we're, we're going to be there, so uh, yeah, yeah. We, we, I look forward to seeing you again. We can't wait for that. We'll see you there, Simon Hill. Uh, I hope we've got out. Uh, you, you've got some some stuff off your chest, and a lot of people will say you are a good bloke, but you are still a Man City fan. But we, we, we've certainly <laughs> we, we've certainly <laughs> we've certainly got over that tonight, mate. So thank you very much. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Thank you, Simon. Thanks, Simon. Thank you, thank you, pal. Cheers, buddy. Seva, we can't thank Simon Hill enough. It was a uh, it was a, a chat that we didn't think it had, w- w- we'd get out of him, but ha- how good! Oh, once again, it's the reason why we started the podcast is for people to come on and be open, honest, and just very transparent. And I think, look, he he got a little bit off his chest. I think it was brilliant. I think uh, he answered a lot of our questions. Yeah, and hopefully the viewers at home get to see a different Simon Hill. You know, well, I certainly did, and I've known him for a while, so yeah. um, I had no idea that his love for football ran that deep. Yeah, so go and check out Simon Hill's podcast, Shim Spider, and so much more, and then tune in and uh, on Tuesday nights to SEN for his show with Alex Brosk. Nine thirty to midnight. Yeah, nine thirty to midnight. We'll certainly be doing that, and we hope you viewers at home really enjoyed that chat with Simon Hill. Uh, at Thanks to our sponsors again, mate. Uh, let's be mate. Visit let's be mates.com.au for all your NBN and mobile needs. Uh, the planning station for Maeve for any of your parties or anything like that, give Maeve a call. DS tipping and excavations. For any of your excavation needs. Best layer in Penrith. <laughs> now he's calling himself the best layer in Penrith. Wow, that's where we're at. Um, little paper boat supply company. It's getting cold. If you need your beanies, air fresheners, socks, anything like that, all logos done up, go and see Matty Clark uh, at Little Paper Boat Supply Company. Rusty Penny Brewing, who are keeping us hydrated on this podcast. And Some beer. How good's the beer going? <laughs> Thanks, boys. Ke- thanks for keeping us hydrated. Uh, MG Active, uh, who's still keeping Sever in shape. Uh, Mark and Logan guy. So uh, jump on their website or their socials and go down for it and 
go down for a run. Yeah, just walk straight in. 51 York Road, South Penrith. And Jeff Lambert. Visit jefflambert.com.au for all your photography, video, videography needs, live streaming, whatever you want. He makes us look good every week. So, Jeff, again, we can't thank you enough, pal. Thank you very much. Cheers, Jeff. Thank you, buddy. And tune in for next week, for next week's episode. Thank you very much. Cheers, guys.